you, no, no, no. You're not going to be made fun of at work or anything like that. People are going to denounce you as friends. No, you are going to be persecuted to the point of death. People will want to kill you because you profess Jesus. Are you sure you want to be baptized? The decision making process. Those are real believers. I'm not saying anything about you. I'm just saying, if we were under persecution today, what would happen to us and our belief? Huh, here you go. They say, you want to be my disciple? You want to be a disciple of Christ? Before I baptize you, I just want to make sure you understand something. You're, you're willing to give your own life. But would you watch your family, your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, your wife, would you watch them die in the place of your faith? You still want to be baptized? Yes, I do. Jesus asked you to be obedient even to death. Now the first, I held up three, but we're not getting there. Now the first two, this, the first two aren't, aren't too hard for us, are they? <clears throat> Especially as Americans, right? They're not very difficult. Those first two requirements are easy. Why? Well, we hate our families. <laughs> it's not a real big issue. Uh, <laughs> I don't have very much immediate family, but I'm sure that when I get married, I'm not going to like my in-laws very much. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yes, I will like my in-laws. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. You've got those wacky family members that you don't mind hating. Ah, Jesus, I can do this. This is not a big problem. I can hate my father and mother. We can all say that we love Jesus more than we love our family. So that's not really hard for us to do. The second thing... Carry, carry your cross daily and follow me. Call it total obedience to persecution on those. We don't have a problem with this either. Why? Because we're not persecuted to death here in America. Not for the next 20 years or so. Mark my words. Not within the next 20 years or so will you not be persecuted for following after Christ to the point where you'll be killed or thrown in jail. So that's not really a big difficult thing for us, those first two. The third one's the one we have a problem with. Uh, look at the third requirement for Jesus. Verse 33. <clears throat> so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. I will read that again. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. I'll let that sink in for a second. <clears throat> now the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples... They knew this to be a very literal sense. And this is what you hear from a lot of preachers. That was very literal. To us, it's very metaphorical. You're not to give up everything that you own. That's what you hear. That is absolutely not true. Not only did Jesus mean this in a literal sense, he taught it in a literal sense. And his disciples followed after him in a literal sense of giving up all of your possessions. The problem is, though, we don't seem to understand what it means to give up something. And us, in our mindset, we mean relinquish something. Just absolutely just, it's not mine anymore, it's somebody else's. That's how we look at it, and unfortunately that's not the best way to look at it. But, but Jesus, that, that, that doesn't seem very practical. How am I supposed to be able to survive? What am I supposed to do with all my possessions? I mean, I've got a family to look after. I can't be giving up all my possessions. You have to match up this last requirement with the rest of Jesus' teachings. And there were a number of disciples that Jesus made that he did not ask them to give up all of their possessions in a literal sense. Zacchaeus is one of them. Remember Zacchaeus? Short little guy. Climbed a sycamore tree. Meets with Jesus, and he has a very real encounter with Jesus. And he was a Jew. He was a tax collector like the Apostle Matthew. He has obedience and a willingness to follow after Jesus. Wants to follow after Jesus. But Jesus has him stay in his own community with the things that he owns. It's very interesting. <clears throat> the best way that I know how to describe this last requirement for discipleship is simply this. Give me your attention. <clears throat> the best way I know how to describe this is that you simply consider your possessions, not your own. 
Have you ever borrowed something from someone? Have you ever borrowed something from someone? <coughs> Did you treat it like garbage? Some of you might have. But seriously, you took care of that thing, right? You used it in such a way, and if you broke it, what did you do? You paid for it. Or you covered the cost to get it fixed, right? Because that's what you do with things that are not yours. You respect them. Newsflash. Nothing you have belongs to you. And if you're here today, and you heard my message last week, you're here because you want to be a disciple of Christ. And you have to get past this point that these things that I have are mine. No, they are not. They belong to the great giver whom you are to give to. Not only in forms of worship, but also in forms of worship to other people. Feeding the hungry, helping the homeless, so on and so forth. Do you use your possessions in such a way where you illustrate that God sits on the throne of your heart? Do you use your possessions in such a way that if God were sitting there looking at you, delegate your money, or give your possessions, or do, do whatever you have with your lawnmower, or your weed eater, or your time, whatever. Is God going to sit there and smile, and say, yeah, you know, all the good, clever way of using that? Or is he just going to say, why are you using that for selfishness? Why are you using that for your own gain? Don't you know that I provide for you everything that you need? Zacchaeus had a very, very real encounter with Jesus. So much so, that his belief in the poor, and his belief towards the injustice he dealt others in his life, yielded the response for not only him paying back four times what was owed to the people that he cheated, but he also gave up half of his possessions to the poor. Notice that. Jesus didn't ask him to do anything, but do that. But I have a question. Uh, why, why does Jesus ask us to give up our possessions? Why does he want us to do that? Because when you live in a world where God is king, you get to deny everything else. Because that's not what's important. What's important is God and that you live in his kingdom. You don't have to worry about possessions. You're obedient even to the point of death. And you steward your possessions in such a way where the hungry are fed and the kingdom of God breaks forth. In such a way where the kingdom of God is witnessed by anyone who views you and views your selflessness, your obedience to Jesus, and the giving that you do. I heard a story about a guy who uh, <coughs> wanted to follow Jesus. And in the midst of this story, um, I got a drink of water. And in the midst of him following Jesus, he goes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, uh, I want to know my calling. What do you want me to do? <coughs> I thought about being a preacher, but and I don't like the ridicule. I don't like the criticism. <coughs> I thought about being a missionary, but that's too hard. You know, what do you want me to do, Jesus? And Jesus says, I, I, want, I want you to be obedient to the point of death. I want you to give me everything. The man says, heck, you got it. Jesus says, do you have anything else to give me? The man says, no. Jesus says, do you got any money? Probably not within that tone, but he said it. The man says, yeah. Jesus says, well, I want that too. The man says, okay, here you go. Here's the money. He says, now what do you want me to do? <coughs> Jesus says, do you have anything else to give me? The man says, well, no. Jesus says, do you have a house? The man says, yeah. He goes, I want that too. But Jesus, where will my family live? Jesus says, oh, you have a family? The man says, yeah, of course. Jesus says, I want that too. The man feels very bad right now. And he falls before Jesus and he says, Jesus, I, I'm very sorry, but I... I I don't have anything else to give you. If you want anything else from me, I don't have anything else to give you. And Jesus says, you don't have anything else to give me. The man says, no. Jesus says, do you have a car? 